Hey, what's up guys? This is my first YouTube tutorial on editing a photo. Um, today we're going to talk about how to edit a single Milky Way photo using only Adobe Lightroom. So just to give you a little bit of background about me, my name is Daniel Gomez and I'm very passionate about photographing nature, the night sky, and I also like to produce time-lapse films. I live in Oregon. I've been uh, photographing for the last seven years now and um, you know, I still love it. <laughs> so anyway, let's delve into this photo. So this photo I took at Cannon Beach, the uh, infamous or famous Haystack Rock, um, which sits just off the coastline. Um, I went there during the Perside meteor shower of 2020, and I actually managed to grab this little meteor here in frame. Over here. Actually, several of them. Uh, there was a ton going on that night. It was really, really a cool night. So anyway, just wanted to kind of start delving into the process and edit this photo. So when I like to edit photos in Adobe Lightroom, first off, I like to make it full screen. But I like to start from top to bottom. You know, there's a lot of different modules in the develop module itself or different areas where you can manipulate and adjust settings. I like to start from the top and kind of work my way down the bottom. You will kind of find me recycling back to it, but anyway. So the first thing I like to start to do is changing the profile. Now there's a bunch of different profiles that are in Adobe Lightroom. I find them, the best one is Adobe Landscape. And the reason why is that I find that it boosts the shadows naturally. Uh, it kind of like reduces the contrast and then it adds more vibrance naturally. So there's just a before and after, you know, of what the two look like. So that's Adobe Color and that's Adobe Landscape. And you can go to Adobe Standard but that's really flat. And Adobe Vivid is, I find, too contrasting and dark. So I usually settle with Adobe Landscape. Now I shot this photo and it kept my settings of my white balance in Kelvin of 4,450, which is kind of on the cool side. Um, every photo is different, so it just depends on what you want to do with the photo. If we drag it really far to the right, everything starts turning really orange and just, it's not very pleasing to me. But I like a little bit of the cooler side. So I'm going to go just a little bit lower than I was at. So I started at 4450 and ended up at 4018. Now tint, that's definitely, um, you know, up to you what you think. I'm definitely more a person that leans to the right when using tint. I just find that if you go far to the left, a lot of the natural pinks in the sky are, are kind of lost. You know, and if you go too far, obviously you're going to have a green photo. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was going to settle at about let's say 16 for now, all right? So I'm not gonna do anything exposure right now. The first thing I wanna do is I build my exposure based off of the blacks. So I like to increase my blacks, and while it does look really flat here, what it does is it boosts all those colors that are naturally hidden in the sky. You know, there's without the blacks, and there's with the blacks at 100. And, you know, there can be some problems with boosting blacks at 100, or boosting any setting to 100. So if you're finding that you have a little bit of problems there, you can reduce it down to like 79. But for me, and using the D850 from Nikon, I never have a problem boosting them all the way to 100. So now I've got my black set. So I'm going to go with the whites. And I'm going to go with the whites until either I get clipping on the right edge of my histogram up here in the top right, or until I just see it look a little too bright. Um, right about here is a good compromise. I'm getting the stars to kind of pop. You know, um, they look a lot more interesting than they did before. So here's before and there's with the whites. So it adds a lot of contrast right away. And then I'm going to down the highlights quite a bit because we've got this little area over here that there was a ship passing by and it illuminated the rock, which actually made a cool effect, but it's pretty bright. <laughs> so I'm going to drag the highlights down until I like it. I mean, you could go all the way down to 100, but I find that that just really flattens the image. Um, so I'm going to stick to about maybe minus 25 just to get it down for now. And we're going to further reduce that later. So I've got everything but shadows. And I will boost the shadows a little bit. I know there's not a lot of, um, a lot of darkness in there, but we're going to add some more contrast and it will be darker. So now that I've got that set up, um, I really like it. I think my exposure overall is just a little bit bright. So I'm going to go down to point negative 3. Just about a third of a stop, if you guys are ever messing around with the, uh, that lingo. So, 
There's texture and clarity and dehaze next. I clarity and texture are actually really similar. Clarity was an old, um, an old tool. It's been around in Adobe Lightroom since I've been using it for the last seven years, and it adds a lot of nice textures to things, uh, but it can tend to over sharpen them and cause a lot of edging. So I typically stay away from texture, or I'm sorry, from clarity, and I'll use texture instead, which is a more recent addition to Adobe Lightroom. Um, I find that it's just a little bit smarter in adding overall uh, clarity to an image. So you can see the before and after. Here's without, here's with, and it greatly improves the, uh, the face and details of the rock. And the nice thing is that it doesn't affect the stars too much. You can, a lot of times, if I boost the clarity, for instance, and I boost it really high, you know, the, I get a lot of noise in the empty, dark shadows that aren't stars in the sky. So... I'm going to keep texture at about 16. I'm not going to mess with dehaze too much because it's not too misty. There was a little bit of fog rolling in that morning, but or I'm sorry, that night. But it wasn't too much to, to really cut through a lot. But just to give it a little more contrast, I'll bring it up to 3. Not a big difference, just a subtle amount that will kind of reduce that, that haze overall. Now for the vibrance and saturation, I never really use saturation. I love vibrance, and the reason why is because saturation affects everything in the photo, whereas vibrance only affects the midtones. And by only affecting the midtones, it just looks a lot more natural. So this is with, that's without, and back. So next we're going to move on. Now that I've gotten, I've gotten my profile selected, I've got my white balance going. My exposure looks good. I'm not going to add any contrast yet with that slider, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but now we're going to move on to the tone curve that I've got everything else set up. So the tone curve is actually a really useful tool. I don't see a lot of tutorials about it, um, but what it can do is it's just another way to add contrast to the image. And linearly, if you've ever heard of what an S-curve is and adding contrast to something, well, that's what I'm about to show you. So the main values that you want to look at here are the lights and the shadows. I don't want to mess with the darks. I don't want to mess with the highlights right away unless I need to. Um, so lights, just a rule for me with Milky Way photos, I go to 20 unless it's too bright. I don't see any clipping in my histogram. And while that orange area is pretty bright, I really like what it did to the Milky Way core. You can see the Milky Way core is really popping with it. And then, like I said, I'll change the shadows, but I'm going to drop them, instead of boosting them, to about negative 11. And if you look at our graph, I have a small S that's occurring because of those adjustments. And if I click this, turn off the tone curve, that's what it looks like before and after. And it's quite a bit of contrast adjustment. So I'm starting to like that, and I can move on. There are other options that you can mess with the tone curve. For instance, um, you have a red, a green, and a blue here. And what that means is you can impart or take away that color that you have selected. So let's say I wanted to add reds to the highlights or to the lights. I would grab an area that's on the graph far to the right, because as you start from the bottom left, it's darks. And as you go to the top right, that's highlights. So I'm going to grab right about here where that quadrant meets. And if I drag it up, you can see that it brings red into the photo. And if I take it down, it takes away red from the photo. This is kind of a little more advanced thing, and I don't necessarily use it here. I use it more in Photoshop, where I have a little bit more control over it. But for anyway, for this adjustment, for this image, I think it looks great without messing with those. So next is the HSL and color panel. Um, I don't mess with too much with changing the colors with hues. Um, saturation I will use a little bit, but it just depends on the color that we're trying to work with. And then luminance I find is the most important thing. So if you click on this little tool right here, it's the adjust the luminance by dragging in the photo, you can click it and it will bring up that reticle and you can click anywhere on the image that you want to change and it will select that color for you. And so if I click on that orange area and I drag down, you'll see that my my orange and yellow shifted down and they're not an equal rate because the the program is trying to guess how much orange how much yellow or how much blue or whatever color is in that area is it going to take away so let's look at the difference between without and with it does a really good job of kind of minimizing how much that glow had from that ship at sea 
Now to kind of further darken it, if you add saturation, it kind of naturally darkens something. So I'm going to selectively darken the orange, and I'm going to select or selectively saturate the orange and the yellow. And so now this is what our kind of overall adjustments have done there. One other thing I want to look at is I want to look at this green from this meteor I have over here. So this meteor is really green and I've always noticed that when I see a, a true uh, giant shooting star they always have a green or yellow trail at the end of them. So I'm going to click, I'm going to click on that and I'm going to drag up the luminance because I actually want it to be brighter. I want it to appear brighter than it did in the photo. So I'm going to zoom out and then I'm also going to add some saturation to it to make it glow even further. Probably to about 15 or so. Any more past that you'll start to notice a little bit of weird things going on with color. So here's before and after, after, after and before. I just really kind of brightened it and made it a little more apparent, right? So now I'm done with that. I'm going to click off that tool. And I'm pretty happy with the saturation and the luminance. Color grading is kind of a recent thing that's been added to Adobe Lightroom, and I'll cover that in a different, different video. Uh, but for now, we're just not going to use it because I really like the way that the white balance is. Okay, now for sharpening and noise reduction. Now, obviously, in using a single image in Milky Way photography is usually often frowned upon, and I often stack my images, usually about 10 to 20. Just depends on you know what I was shooting. If there were a lot of clouds, I'd only stack two because they'll show a lot of movement and I'll lose a lot of that texture of the clouds by stacking them. So anyway, obviously this is a little, little noisy and it's just the way it is. Uh, the D850 does a really good job of cutting out a lot of noise. And also, I shot this with an aperture of f1.8, which was wide open for my 45mm lens at an ISO of 6400 and 6 second shutter speed. Uh, the six second shutter speed was to make sure that those sharp stars were sharp, f1.8, so that way I could really um, absorb as much light as possible, and then ISO 6400 just to make it the exposure bright enough to see. So the first thing I'll start with is we'll go with sharpening. Um, Lightroom automatically keeps it set at 40, and that's just the way it is when I import it. So I typically like to, you know, we want to zoom in when you're, you're checking this out, otherwise you're going to have a hard time telling what you're doing. I'll usually keep the sharpening at about 58. That's a good number. Um, if you go past a certain point, you start to see there's a lot of noise that you're introducing actually to the image. So you don't want to go too far. Let's keep it at 58. Now radius, that refers to how, how wide those pixels are being sharpened. But so a cool trick on Lightroom is if you hold down Alt and then I drag the radius button, I can kind of see an outline of how much it's going to create a radius around those details. Um, so I don't usually go much beyond 1.5. I find that beyond 1.5, it just starts to look funny and like I've got um, fringing or I've got a halo around the image, right? So I've got that set. Detail is kind of standard at 25. If you take it out, you can kind of see right away you lose. It, it, it gained uh, quite a bit from that detail at 25. So I'm going to bring it up just until I start to like it. About 30 is pretty good. And you'll notice that my as I do it, my, my darks in my sky are getting really noisy. So I'm going to keep it at about maybe 20. And that looks pretty good. Now, the most important part of the sharpening is the masking of it. You want to make sure that it applies to a certain area. And you don't want it to sharpen everything, because if you sharpen shadows, it's just going to introduce more noise to them and make the photo look grainy. So we're going to hold down Alt again. I'm going to click on masking and I'm going to drag it to the right. Now you'll see that it's getting, it's brighter to the left, meaning that everything is getting sharpened. And then as I go to the right, everything that's dark or black is no longer being sharpened. So just the what is highlighted in white is getting affected. Now, here is, you know, I'm getting everything in my image, I'm getting the stars reflected, but I'm getting a little bit too much noise in the stars, you know. I kind of want it to go until I just kind of barely see the edge of everything. So that's a pretty good line right about there. And I'm going to go right back just a little bit more. And let's see. That looks pretty good. So if we 
take it on and off that's without the detail and back on and now we got to add some noise reduction now typically I just normally go to 30 and that's usually a good number um, but in this image in particular it becomes very very soft you know from 0 to 30 <laughs> so that's something we kind of have to counteract so I'm not going to go as high with a noise reduction. I'm going to go to about, let's see, maybe about halfway, about 15. So that, let's see, go back to 15. So that's at zero, that's at 15. It definitely smooths the image a little bit, but we can still further make this a little, bring back some of that detail. So you'll see that there's a detail right underneath the noise reduction slider. Um, and I'm going to just move that to the right. And as you see, I move it to the right. I gain back a little bit more details. So I'm going to keep it at about 45. I don't need to mess with that too much. And then what contrast does in noise reduction is it helps um, bring back that contrast you lost by using noise reduction. So if I bring it up just a little bit, I notice it's going to change just a little bit of the contrast overall. It's kind of a subtle difference. Um, but I find that it makes a huge, a huge uh, difference. So the last thing, it's already been taken care of for us because Lightroom imports it this way. And I have color noise reduction at 25. Look at what happens when I bring it down to zero. <laughs> it is a noise nightmare. Like it is terrible. And uh, it can be definitely discouraging if you see your image like this right away. But one really quick way to do it is to go to the color noise reduction. And bring it to where just you stop seeing so many different diverse colors. You know, as I get to about here, about three, it's still pretty obvious. It gets to eight, it's starting to lose that distinction. And then at about 17, it's really smooth. It's really smooth. And then the last thing we can do is we can mess with the detail and the luminance from the color noise. I prefer not to, um, just because I like the way that color noise reduction works automatically. And so I just don't want to mess with that. So here's the difference before and after. This is completely unsharpened, no noise reduction at all, right? And then here is the result with noise reduction, sharpening, vast improvement. Vast improvement. OK. So now we've got lens corrections. There's not too much going on here. Um, removing chromatic aberrations, clicking these two tick boxes, as well as profile corrections, I find is very helpful. You'll notice that when I clicked on that profile correction, it greatly um, took away the vignette I had naturally. Now, the, the annoying thing about night images is there's a ton of noise hiding in those shadows. And because it disabled my vignette, now I have a bunch of noise available, right? And um, there's a way to correct that. So you just go down to the distortion and vignetting here. I want to change the vignetting that it, that it gave by clicking the enable profile corrections. So I'm going to drop it down all the way to zero. And now it looks just like the way it was before. And if I bring it all the way to the right, you're going to notice everything gets really white around the edges. So I like to keep it at zero. Yes, I'm kind of hiding a little bit of noise, but it also just, uh, I like the way the vignette looks when it's wide open for a night image in particular. Now for the rest of the modules at the end, I, I don't mess with transform because I don't really want to alter this image the way it looks. I don't have anything that I need to get rid of in the frame, so I'm not going to mess with that. And the highlight priority for vignettes, I already mess with vignetting. And I've got calibration down here, which I also just don't really use. Um, you would use that maybe if you had some real, real big issues with your colors in your frame. But here, I don't really find that I have any. So now that we did all the, the basic camera raw adjustments, we can mess with some of the, uh, the more interesting stuff, like the radial and the graduated filter. So the graduated filter is exactly what it sounds like. It's a filter that gradually um, introduces well, a setting and then drops off as it, as it goes on. So for the effect, what I'm thinking I want to do is I want both the top and the bottom of the frame to be kind of darker because I want the focus to be Haystack Rock right here and the bit of the Milky Way over there as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the effect. I'm going to go down to Exposure 
and I want it to be darker. So I'm going to go about a third of a stop, which is negative 0.3. And then I'm going to click where I want my filter to begin. I'm going to hold shift because what that does is it keeps a straight line for you. And as you see, as my red keeps going, that's telling me where the effect is taking place and where it's going to drape off. So I want it to end right about the bottom of the haystack rock right there. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing with another one up top. So I'm going to shift, click, and then bring it straight down. And I'm probably going to bring it to about right there because I don't want my meteor to be cut off too much. And so that's what it looks like with them, without, and with. It just kind of makes it to where the center is a little more of the focus of the image. So I've got that. I've got my sky, my bottom part of the sky, or the reflected sky, darkened. Now what I want to do is I want to brighten Haystack Rock. So I'll click Exposure again, but instead of going minus in Exposure, I want to go up about a third in Exposure and increase my whites to 10. And so instead of using the graduated filter, I'm using a radial filter now, so I can create a circular or oval shape. I'm going to drape it right over Haystack Rock. Now, what I want to do is make sure that this fits just over the rock. And something I didn't, something that you can do with a radial filter is you can feather it. And what the feathering means is whether it's going to soften the edges as it as it kind of dissipates and um, filters out to the end of your your circle or radial filter that you've created. Um, and as you go to the left, it basically makes a hard stop. So everything outside of the circle you've created is not going to be affected, but everything within will be strongly affected. And you'll notice that it won't look very natural. So I want a feather of about 80, because I don't want it to be too much near the edge, uh, but I want it to kind of smooth off. So I'm going to close that. And this is with the feathering at 0, and this is with the feathering at 80. <laughs> Just looks a little more natural, right? And so we can turn that off. Here's without, and here's with. Just brings a little more of the attention back to Haystack Rock, which is the whole point of the photo. So now I'm going to make a new one. I'm going to make a new radial filter. And what I want to do is I want to darken this bright spot from that ship over on the left side. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to make my filter just to kind of cover that orange area right there. And I'm going to change this back to highlights. So that way I'm dropping the highlights about negative 30, and then I want to drop the exposure down too. All right, now what that does is it puts it all over that area, and it kind of also darkens that rock, which I don't like. So if you use a range mask, which is at the bottom of the radial filter, so I clicked on the filter, got my range mask, and there's two options here. You can either choose to, to you make a range mask with color, or by luminance. I'm going to go by luminance because the brightest spot behind the dark rock is what I want to affect. And so you'll notice that you have a range here and you have a smoothness. So we'll start with range and as I hold Alt, click on the left side of the range and drag it to the right, you're going to see that everything in white is what I'm affecting. So I want to drop the exposure of the what's all there in the white. And as I go to the left, all the shadows are kind of showing up. The rock is getting affected, but I didn't want that. So I'm going to go all the way to the right, right about there at 93. And it shows that the white is just being affected um, with, my, with my radial filter. So I'm not going to mess with smoothness. I think it looks pretty good. But if you hold Alt and click on smoothness, you can kind of make it a little more feathered, or you can make it a little more harsh in the adjustment. So we're going to keep it at about 40, so it's not affecting our blacks on the rock. And I'm going to go ahead and close that. So let's see. Here's with the radial filters on and off, making more of the attention to the haystack rock and not the ship in the background. All right, so the last thing I think I want to do with this image is I want to make the Milky Way pop a little bit more. It, it is pretty popping with the, the tone curve that we did earlier and adding the whites, but I think we can make it just a little bit better. So this is actually a, uh, <laughs> a preset I used 
for all my weddings and um, just portrait shoots in general. What it does is I have the exposure boosted, I give it a little bit of contrast, shadow boost, and white boost, and clarity as well. So I'm, that's an old setting for me, so I'm going to change the clarity for texture. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a filter. So I'm going to make a big circle, and then I'm going to rotate it, clicking the side of the filter, and position it just over that core, right? And so what I want to do now is I'm going to close it. I'm going to show you what it looks like without and on. So here's without. It's with. It's bringing quite a bit of uh, a difference in making that the the part of the Milky Way pop. But I want to further kind of show, or at least make more of a luminance mask. And I just want it to affect the bright stars. So I'm going to do the same thing I did in adjusting the radial filter over the uh, ship's lighting behind the rocks. I'm going to hold down Alt. I'm going to click on the left side of the range and bring it all the way to the right until I start seeing those shadows disappear. Right about there. So I know that I'm getting more of an adjustment on the whites and not the shadows, which I, I don't want to bring up at all, actually. So there we go. That looks pretty nice. Now the last thing I'm thinking I kind of want to do to really make it pop is I'm going to do the same kind of filter. So I'm going to click over this filter and if you right click it, you can actually duplicate it and make an identical filter that sits right over the same area. But I want to change all these settings. I want to, instead of adding uh, brightness, I want to take away brightness in the core, in those shadows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down about Point negative three on exposure. And I'm going to go down here to my luminance. And I'm going to adjust it again, holding down Alt, clicking that, and going to the left. So instead of, if I want to attack the, the darks, I'm going to come from the right side of the luminance range and go to the left. So you can see as I go to the left that I'm getting a lot more of the the shadows being affected. So here's before, after. All right, so now here is the final before and after image. On the left hand side, you've got the before, and on the right, you've got the final one. And that was using Lightroom to just edit a single Milky Way image. If you guys want to see more tutorials, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. And if you have a topic you'd like me to cover, please comment it down below. I do offer lessons via Skype where I can teach you all of these editing techniques as well as shooting at my website, www.dreamcapturedimages.com backslash lessons. And I'll link that down below too. Have a great week, you guys. Thank you.